happy Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Hope everyone had a nice weekend. Any questions about the lab, about sensible arrays, about Java to get us started? All right. Well, it's not really a question. It's more like something that I wrote, and I'm confident that it should have worked. But it, it does like 98% of the time. But the 2% it doesn't. Can I show it to you? Uh, that would be uh, a great thing for, for office hours right after class. Okay. Um, yeah, anything that involves randomness might have this property where uh, it may get unlucky some small uh, fraction of the time and not work the way you expect. Uh, other questions? Right. So it's a good question. Uh, I'll give you how I generally think about comments and then how they will be graded uh, on, the, on the lab assignments. So how I generally think about comments is uh, there are two audiences for a comment. Uh, there's, there's a future you Or someone else who is working with the directly with the code you wrote, and then there's someone who is not changing or modifying the code that you wrote, but who is using the code. Comments for future you are any line of code or piece of code that you found particularly tricky to think through how it works. Uh, such as you came up with a strategy for how to randomly uh, start the coin strip board, but it was a little complicated and you it took a little while to think through and, and figure out how to make it happen in Java. That would be a great place to leave yourself or someone looking at the code in the future a comment just sort of explaining what's going on. So that, say, if you come back to the code one week, a month, six months later, you don't have to spend a bunch of time kind of re-figuring out what's going on with no help. For people that are using your code, that's what, say, a comment at the top of every method saying what this method does, what its parameters are, what its return value is. Every method should be commented that way so that anyone kind of using your, the class that you've implemented in Java, who's going to be calling those methods, can look and see what, they, what they're supposed to do. Uh, similarly, anyone looking at the file, the .java file that you wrote, should be able to see who wrote it, when was it written, what was it for. That's what the name, date, and description are at the top of every file you're trying to. In terms of how the comments are graded, they're going to be part of the style grade. And for the most part, the style will be graded automatically using a tool called check style. Uh, this is something that uh, there's an extension for it in VS Code. There's a walkthrough of how to install that extension and what you should see when you do in the little intro video to Lab 2, which is posted uh, today for Lab 1. The only thing that Check style is, is check, for, for the first two labs, the only thing that check style is checking is that you filled in the name, date, and description at the top, and that all of the object fields are either public or private. Uh, but eventually later in the course, check style will check things like all methods have a comment above them and, and other style things. Uh, so that, that's how the use of comments will, will be, be graded. Other questions? Yeah, Ben. Um, if you enter a coin number that's longer than the length of your like, number of coins you have, it just says, like, out of bounds. Is that something we have to count for? Or not? Uh, so when you play the game and you enter a move that's not valid, it the, the, the main method uh, uh, of coin strip is set up so that if it's not a valid move, if 
the is valid move method returns false, it will ask, it will tell the user that's not valid and ask for it again. So this is an example of is valid move should return false if the coin number that is passed into that method is bigger than the number of coins. So uh, the short answer is no, there should not be an array index out of bounds exception. Is valid move should be saying false, this isn't a valid move. I mean, is um, any other use invalid user inputs um, something that we have to take, to take care of as well? Instead of like entering number, say the user enters a digit, I mean, not a digit, but a letter. Uh, so I, it, it's fine if the, that would be something that the main method would need to handle, uh, and it's fine. You're not responsible for that, so it's fine if, if it, uh, the, I think the provider code will crash if anything besides an integer is entered, and that's fine. Other questions? All right, we have uh, quite a bit to get to uh, today, so let's get started. Uh, want to, there are, believe it or not, still a couple things uh, related to arrays that, and making arrays extensible that I want to mention. The first is, What do we have to do if we want to add an element to the front of the array? So we have these fixed size arrays in Java. Say our current array has four spots, three, seven, nine, two. And what we want is to add uh, uh, We want to add the number four at index zero, meaning we want to, to put four right here. Could we just inside, uh, if this is our, uh, our variable r, could we just do R bracket zero equals four. Is that going to, to add a new thing at the front of our array? Liam? Yeah. It'll just replace three with four. Exactly. It's just going to change the first element. So, anyone have a suggestion for a strategy we could use to add a new element at the beginning of the array? Seriously? Um, when you could do just like shift the array over by one and then place it in there? Yeah, we want to basically move the stuff that's in the way, all of it over one spot, so that we have an empty spot at index zero where we want to insert. We have to be careful how we do this, because if we start at index zero and move index zero to index one, what's that going to do? Yeah, we're end up going to end up with three here, and then we move index one over to index two, and that's going to copy three here and three here. And we're, so we have to be careful to start from the end of the array and move two over one spot, and then move nine over one spot, seven over one spot, three over one spot, and now we can do array bracket zero equals four, and replace this with four. So we had to shift the elements over by one, starting at the end, to make room for our new element. Let's see. Are we doing that assuming that there's room at the end? Like what if there's 
Yes. Yeah, so this assumes that there is a like index four for us to put something in, which in the case of our extensible array, we will have ensured that there's enough space. And so we'll know that there is something. But if our array was actually just four, we would first have to create a new array, copy everything over, and then do the shifting part. Other questions? All right, if you're curious what this operation would look like in Java, uh, the extensible array notes have the code for an add method that can add a new element at any index in the array, 80. Could you do something like, and so I like to like shift everything over, you like make a new array, like in this case with like five spots, and then put four right at the beginning and then copy the first array over? Is that any different? Uh, that that that's another approach that would that would work fine if we don't if we didn't have room create a new array and copy it over but shift it over one it sort of that's a uh, would save us a little work uh, in the case where we have to do both create a new array and move things over. Christopher, um, this is slightly different but related. So does the dot append method does that change the length of the array? Like, like our, our array lists. Uh, yeah, because I thought you couldn't change the length of a maintainer. Uh, yes, so in Java, our arrays are fixed in length. After we create them, we cannot change how many spots there are. And so that motivated the creation of this array list class which inside it has just one of these normal arrays, but is doing this work of, if it needs to be bigger, doubling it in size and copying the old one over. Other questions? So there is uh, a question on the, on the quiz that's out today, due Wednesday night, that asks you to count how many shifts are required, and that's exactly this situation where how many times did we have to sh shift something over? That happens when we add at a specific spot. It also happens when we remove. So if we go back to this situation, we wanted to remove the first thing we would do that by, again, shifting things over in order to kind of replace the thing that we're removing with by shifting everything above it over by one. Does that make sense? All right. So... One final consideration is when I was writing the code for our array list, I said it would be an array int list because our internal uh, our our private uh, field data was, I had to make it a certain type of array, and so it was an integer array, and so this array list could only hold ints. But what if I wanted to have an array list of strings or an array list of doubles? Like, would I need to write an entirely separate class, uh, array string list, array double list, and so on. I, I could do that, but it would be a real pain and a real flaw uh, in terms of um, uh, writing software in the Java language if I wanted, if in order to have some sort of data structure that could hold different types of data, 
uh, I had to have kind of a different, entirely different version of it for every different type of data. So the instead of this, Java provides a way to make a class generic, which means that this class is going to be able to hold any different kind of thing. And when someone creates an instance of that class, they will fill in what type of data it's holding. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to make an array list class. I'm going to say this array list holds things of type E. And E here is what we can think of as a placeholder. It's something that's going to be filled in. It's like a TBD type of thing is in this class. And that means that my private field data will be an array of things of type E. Because whatever type that gets filled in here, my internal array should hold things of those types. Then when someone goes to create an instance of the array list class, I'm going to say, okay, this is an array list of strings. And when I write down the type of this array list variable, I then fill in a specific type that then gets filled in for e for just this particular array list. I could have another array list. But again, I fill in a specific type. The thing that I fill in inside this greater than and less than, these angle brackets that, that Java uses for this, has to be an object which means that I can't put a primitive type there. I couldn't put lowercase n. So I have to use the object version of lowercase int filled in here to make an array list that holds integers. And when your Java code is compiled. It's the Java compiler that is doing this sort of filling in this placeholder uh, based on what you put in, in the uh, angle brackets when you created that array list object. All right, what questions do you have, Aiden? What's the difference between a primitive int and then like the object integer? The object integer uh, has some methods that you can use. It, ha it it's basically, uh, uh, you can think of it as it's the lowercase int wrapped in an object box. Uh, and this is a, uh, I would say, annoying consequence of the way the Java language is designed, where we have this distinction between primitive types and objects. They work differently. And there are certain situations where we can only use objects. And this means that we need these sort of object wrappers, little kind of object boxes around the primitive types so we can use them in this sort of situation. But underneath, like inside that object box, there's no difference. It's still just an integer. Yeah, Brian. Is there an object version of every primitive? There is an object version of every primitive type, yes. And they all kind of whole words spelled out, capitalized. Uh, so capital D double, uh, capital D boolean would be the object versions. Luke? 
Is it common for um, like common terminology to use a capital letter P for whenever it is? Uh, yeah. So this, what this placeholder is called, you could call it whatever you want. Uh, it's just it's wherever that shows up, it's going to get filled in. Uh, but by convention, it's often E is what's used. And the, the starter code for lab two is a generic data structure, and so it does indeed use this, uh, this kind of notation with the letter E. Liam. What does it say, R underscore int? Uh, this was just my variable name. I named my array list of strings R and my array list of integers R underscore. Yes. I, I tend to put underscores in my variable names, but the more kind of Java way is to do this, this kind of what's called camel case, where kind of letters in the middle get capitalized to separate out multiple terms in a variable name. Other questions? All right. So array lists were pretty cool. We took this fixed size array and sort of built something around it that was flexible in size. And we talked about at the very end of last time how even though sometimes adding a new thing to the end of our array list meant we had to do a bunch of copying, if we average that out over adding a bunch of things, because we were doubling the size each time, that actually worked out to be no extra work on average to add an element to the end of our array list. But unfortunately, this does not hold true, as we've just seen, when we're removing something or when we're, say, adding to the beginning. Because no matter whether our array, internal array, is big enough or not, when we add something in the, to the beginning, we have to do the work of shifting everything else in there over. And when we remove something, we have to do the work of shifting everything else down one spot. And so imagine we were building some sort of inventory system where we had tons of different uh, items for sale that we wanted to keep track of. Uh, and in this big list of items, we often wanted to uh, remove specific items from the middle of this list or add new items to the beginning. Uh, and if we were doing with this with this if we were doing this with an array list, we'd be doing all this extra shifting uh, that that we'd really like to be able to avoid. We want we want to avoid situations where operations we're doing incur a bunch of extra work for every single operation. And so we've been dealing with arrays which we can think of as one big chunk of the computer's memory. Uh, and each of our array elements are right next to each other in this chunk of memory. But what if we could kind of break this array up and instead of this chunk of memory, so instead of our three, seven, nine, two like this, we have three in one spot, nine over here, seven, and two. And for each thing in our kind of collection of numbers, we just have it. refer to the next thing that comes after it. So three would say, after me comes seven. And seven would say, after me comes nine. And nine would say, well, after me comes two. And the advantage of this is now imagine we want to put our new uh, number four at the beginning of this list and we have some variable start that's keeping track of where the beginning is. 
all we need to do is create a new one of these boxes, have it point to what should come after it, and then change where our list starts. And this is going to make some of these operations that our ArrayList was not well suited for uh, a lot more efficient. And this sort of approach has a name. It's called a linked list. Because now instead of having our list based on an array, we have our list based on this sort of chain of arrows, these links that kind of show us which element comes after what. Questions on this idea kind of conceptually? Let's make this a little more concrete. So our real link list is going to consist of two types of objects. We're going to have our link list object, and in our link list object, we're going to keep track of the count, how many uh, items are in our list. Uh, that will start at a zero. And we're going to keep track of the head, that is the, uh, the start, the first uh, box in our list. And this will start out as, make the values red. This will start out as null. Null is the special Java value that means uh, no object here. So uh, our, I'll write down the types of these. Count would be an integer, and head would be something called a list node, which is what I'm going to call the objects that are these boxes here. So my list node is going to have a value of type E, because we want to make a list node that we can fill in with any particular type. And these arrows will be in the form of a variable that's just referring to another list node that I'll call next. And so I will start out with this link list that has count zero and head null. And then when I say, uh, let me add, uh, so I have a list. I'm going to make it a linked list of strings. I'll call it list, and it will equal uh, new. Link list. And then I'll say uh, 
list.add first the string with just the letter A. And that means I'm going to make a list node that has the value of the string A. And null for its next, Christopher. Can you write it a little bigger? Uh, yes, let me just move this to somewhere where there is more space. Thank you for asking. All right, so I first made a new linked list and then said list add first a and to make this add first operation happen I created a new list node value a its next starts as null and then I changed the head of my link list to be equal to this new node and change the count to one. With me so far? This makes sense? If I call add first again with uh, the string AA, I'd like you to uh, discuss with your neighbors kind of what about this picture would need to change to create a list that had uh, where AA was now the first node in the list. All right. Any uh, any thoughts on how we might? Uh, what's one thing we might need to do uh, as part of this second add first operation, Liam? Change count to two. Change count to two. Absolutely. We're going to have two things in here. What's another step we might need to take? Cam. Would A move down to where null is, and then A would be replaced by the double A? Or? Uh, it's an interesting thought. This, each of these boxes is one of these list node objects. Uh, and so the, the top will always have is the value. The bottom will always be kind of this arrow to the next node, or null to mean there isn't a next thing in the list. Uh, so I, I wouldn't want to switch these, uh, but I do need to do something with nodes. Jeffrey? Create a new list node object. Yeah, when we want to add a new thing to our linked list, we're going to need a new node to hold the, the string AA that we want to add. So I'm going to make a new node, and when I create a new node, I'll start it out with the value, and we'll start it out with a next of null. That's just what the, the next will start out as. So I have my new node, but right now, if I like started at the head and looked through the list, I would never find this node with AA. I just go to A and then see, okay, there's nothing after that. So I need to change something about arrows that are going on with here. Yeah, sir. Yeah, you would just change the head to go over to the double A uh, uh, list node, and then the 
less known of the double A point over to the single A. Exactly. That if I want to put something at the front of my linked list, well, I have this within my linked list, this variable head, this field, refers to the first node in the list. And I don't want to remove the existing node from the list. I want to have it just be the second thing in the list. So I now have added this A as the first because if I look at what is at the head, I see AA. And if I look at the next thing after that, I'll see A. Do those steps make sense? Questions on this? Yeah. Well, we eventually see how this plays out in code. It's kind of abstract. Yes. Yeah, so there are uh, uh, there are kind of two two parts. This one is sort of conceptually what our list is going to look like as we do this these operations and then yes absolutely we will we will be looking at uh, at the code for this okay. Wait, how does a a node to point at no a single a so uh, our steps were priest count We created our new list node. Uh, we need to and this third step is how it knows that whatever we're, whenever we're putting in a new thing at the beginning of our list, it's next needs to point to whatever the current thing at the front of the list was. And so we created this new node, we made its next refer to the current thing at the front of the list, and then we changed head. Then we changed the front of the list to be our new node. All right, let's, I do think it's a good suggestion to take a look at what this would look like in code. So we would have our kind of link list uh, and list node uh, defined with these fields and then our Our public void add first, which would take in uh, the value that we want to add to the list. That was the string A and double A in these in this example. Uh, we would then Say a list node of E, which I might call new head. Make a new list node. make our new node's value be this new value that we're adding in to the list.
then do step three here, where we say, okay, the thing that's going to come after the new front of the list is the current front of the list, the current head. So I'm changing this link list instance variable head. And then add one to count, which I could do sort of at any point in here. I had it, had it first and up here, but it doesn't make any difference if I, if I do it at the end. And this is all we would need to add our new, uh, uh, our new uh, string to, to the front of our list. This is all we need for our add first method. Sure. Yeah. Oh, um, what, if you were to, I guess, sub delete slash subtract a, a, a value, we just take the pointer of the values next to it and just move them over. Yes, so. That's a good, a good question. How do we remove nodes uh, from our linked list? Um, uh, before we get, uh, and there's going to be some interesting issues that arise when we go to, to remove nodes. Uh, before we get to uh, removing things, uh, any other questions about how we add things? Sure. Do you ever add stuff to the end, or is it just for the beginning? Uh, excellent question. Uh, do we ever add stuff to the end? Absolutely. We want to be able to add stuff to the end. Um, what would we need to... Uh, but if we want to add stuff to the end, we need to change the last node in our list. If they add stuff to add something to the end, we need a new node here, and we need to change this next to refer to that node. This prevents, presents a bit of a difficulty because all we have is the front. All we have is the head. Any suggestion on how we would find the last node in our list? Jake? Um, we can use like the next value times the number that count is. So right now it's two. So we have like the first next value and then the second next value. We can change them the second one. Yeah, we that that's the right idea. We want to follow these next arrows until we get to the end. Uh, And so if we want to what's called traverse a linked list, which means kind of go through all the nodes in our list, we want to repeatedly follow, like use the next value of a node, and we want to repeatedly do something in code, what do we use? A loop. And, and in this case, we could say let's have a kind of current, let's know basically a, uh, a, a finger, uh, a variable that we'll use to keep track of kind of where in the list we are. And then say while The next thing after current does not equal null. Move our current.
current variable to the next node. So if we look at this with our picture here, we say, all right, start current at the head. And then while its next does not equal null, so we're looking at the, the this next, okay, it's not null, it actually refers to some real list node. So then we say, all right, current equals current.next. And now we're on this one. And we say, okay, does this next equal null? If it didn't, we would say, okay, current equals current.next until we got to the last node in our list, which will, its next will have to be null because there's no node after it. And so we repeatedly follow these next pointers that would get us to the end and then we could add a new node there if we wanted to add something to the end. Questions on that? Does that make sense? Instead of doing all this looping, we could upgrade our list, however. And say, in addition to our head, we're also going to keep track of the tail, the last node in our list. So then instead of having to loop through all of our nodes to get to the end, we can just jump directly there. So tail, in this case, would be our Note with the letter A, because that's the last one in our list. All right, let's get to the problem of how do we remove nodes from our list. So... Again, we'll start with uh, the picture and then move to the code. So, let's say we have a linked list like this, nodes A, B, and C. And we want to uh, we want to remove the B node from our list. So again, take a minute, brainstorm with your neighbors what we want to change about this picture to cause our middle node here to no longer be part of the list. Any, uh, any thoughts on what we could change about this picture to remove our, our middle node? Ron? You could just get A to like point directly to C without having to go to D. Yeah, we just want to bypass our node B. Because if we're doing, if we're, if how we're figuring out what things are in our list just by following these, uh, next, following the next from node to node, we change our next to skip over B, it's effectively removed from the list. We'll never see it as we go down the list. Sir? Doesn't that imply that? Anything that's like deleted is still, I guess, stored in memory. So, uh, this is uh, something if you take a, a CS208, talk a lot about uh, how stuff exists in memory. Uh, the short answer here is anything in Java which doesn't have one of these arrows to it, which basically nothing in your program can reach it, Java cleans it up for you. Java throws it away. It's called garbage collection.
Okay. In that case, we want to add B again. Do we need to make a new list node object? Just B. Yeah. So. Uh, Question is, if we want to add B again at this point, do we need to make a, a new list node? And we absolutely do, because after we removed it, Java gets rid of it. And so if we then uh, wanted to put B back in the list, we'd need to create a new, a new node with B. And then uh, if we wanted to put it back in the same spot, we'd again need to change this next to be B and set B to have the same next as A used to have. Other questions? So one uh, uh, one correction I should make before I forget, the code that I've written up here for add first, there's something missing from it. I never actually change what the head is. I never say actually change my new, my lists head equal to new head. So to actually put uh, a new node uh, into my list, I did have to change what the head was to refer to that new node. And so that's a step I had left out of this at first. One kind of unfortunate thing about how this uh, list is currently designed is I go back to the situation where I want to remove B. The thing that I had to change to remove that I didn't have access to that from B. Like if I had some variable current that referred to this node, I wouldn't have any way to remove this node from the list without somehow getting a hold of node, the node with A in it, because that's the next that I need to change. Uh, and we'd really like to be able to, if we have a variable referring to any node, we can add something after it, we can remove it, we can add something before it, we can kind of do anything we want uh, related to that node. And the way that we can make this happen is to upgrade our the definition of our list node you just keep track both of what comes after it in the list and what comes before it a next and a previous and if we have this next and previous then our picture here each node has twice the number of arrows, each node keeps track of what comes after it and what comes before it. The node at the front, its previous would be null because there's nothing before it. The node at the end, its next would be null because there's nothing after it. 
And so now if we wanted to remove, if we have current and we want to remove it from the list, we now have within current all the information that we need to cause the list to skip over it. We can say, okay, get the previous node from current and change its next to be current's next, which is say, take this current's previous next variable and change it to refer to the same thing that is the next of current. So this says, okay, skip over it in the forward direction. And then we can say, okay, it's next previous skip over current in the previous direction. And so this has, uh, there are now no arrows that are pointing to uh, our node B from any other nodes in the list. And so Java will get rid of it and we would never encounter it as we go through the list, either in the forward or backward direction. What are your questions on, on this? This sort of link list changing arrows can be a little confusing. Yeah. What's the situation where we would be at current? Is that like if we're looping through all of the lists? Uh, notes, yes. Uh, good question. Uh, so let me pull up a bit of code here. So this is the starter code for the lab. And we want to give here we are somewhere. Yes, we want to give uh, a user of this list the ability to say, okay, remove this specific value from the list. So be like, I know the string B is in the list. I don't know where, or I don't care, but wherever the string B is in the list, go find it and then remove it. So we would have uh, a loop where while we haven't reached the end of our list and while the value at our current node does not equal the thing we're looking for, go to the next one. And so that would be a situation where then we have current would end up referring to the node that we want to remove. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yeah, I mean. Would that work only for uh, arrays where there is one instance of what we're looking for? So uh, the uh, the doc the documentation for this method says we're going to remove the first node where that matches. So if there were multiple Bs, it would just remove the first one it found. All right, so I uh, encourage you, and the lab uh, to write up encourages you as well to work through the practice problems uh, in the notes for today before you start working through the lab. Uh, your task in this lab is uh, you are given a complete working implementation of a linked list. And in this case, uh, when we have... Uh, when we have 
of the next and the previous, the arrows going in both directions, uh, we call that a doubly linked list, because we have two links for each node. And uh, if you look through this code, there's all sorts of places where we have to check uh, whether something is null. Or check whether next is null, whether the thing we're on is null, there's all these null checks, and if we were to miss any of them, then we might have our list crashing with a null pointer exception. And so uh, your task is to take uh, another upgrade to a linked list uh, that's described in a uh, handout from the textbook uh, and apply it to the linked list you're given for the lab. Um, and the lab write-up outlines a sort of step-by-step -step kind of the methods of the linked list class you should change uh, as you go through. But this level will be much easier if you go into it feeling uh, good about these linked list operations, which is uh, why I think the practice problems would be very helpful. Uh, one uh, thing that I want to highlight about this code uh, is we have our doubly linked list class. It is generic. It can hold any type of thing. And when someone creates a doubly linked list, they say, okay, this is for strings or this is for integers, whatever it is. Uh, but this list node class with the value, the previous and the next, uh, it isn't a separate class defined in some separate file. It's what's called a private class that, ex that exists only inside our doubly linked list class. So it's a way of the doubly linked list class is creating its kind of own specialized list node class that only it can use for its, in for its internal operations. Uh, and so this list node is... Uh, use kind of within the uh, 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 within the doubly linked list kind of in the same way that I've been doing on the board where we can create new ones. It's just not relying on some other Java file somewhere. The constructor for this list node is a little fancier than the one that I was using up here, which didn't take any parameters, and I kind of manually set the value and the next. The one uh, here takes in a value that the node should have, and also the nodes that should be before and after the new one that you're making. And so this both sets up the previous and next of the new node that you're making, and changes the next and previous of these neighboring nodes uh, so long as they are, they are not null. All right, any uh, questions, thoughts on any of this uh, linked list stuff from today? Is there like a general rule of thumb where we should be using, let's say, a linked list or, or double linked list versus like an array list? Yes, this is uh, uh, excellent question for a class that's about, uh, in large part, which data structure to should you use. Uh, and we now have kind of two competing structures. Uh, we have our array list and our linked list, uh, and. In the notes for today, which uh, we'll go over uh, next time, because uh, I want to, to make sure to uh, not to, to rush through them, we'll kind of go through and, and compare and contrast what things is an array list good at, what things are a linked list good at. Uh, and it comes down to, as it does for most data structures, uh, which operation will you be doing a lot, because you want that one to be fast, and which operations are less important because there's no data structure that we're going to look at that's going to be efficient for all possible operations. There will always be some that you want to use that data structure for and some that 
you would prefer not to. And so we'll look at that in, in detail next time. Uh, before I let you go, uh, I need to tell you about our 13th president, Millard Fillmore. Uh, you may remember, took over after a year and a half of uh, Zachary Taylor. Um, biggest uh, event during uh, uh, Millard Fillmore's presidency was the Compromise of uh, 1850, which was there was a tremendous controversy uh, in the U.S. about uh, all this new territory that the uh, country had just taken. Uh, would slavery be allowed there? And what would the future of slavery be? And unlike Taylor, who didn't support this compromise, uh, uh, Miller Fillmore pushed for it and uh, basically kicked the can down the road by admitting California as a free state, uh, organizing some new territory, uh, embracing the concept of popular sovereignty, sovereignty, which said people in the territories should vote on whether slavery would be allowed there, uh, and um, uh, strengthening the uh, or, uh, um, intensifying the fugitive slave law. Uh, this was uh, seen by uh, nationally by opponents of, of slavery as uh, kind of uh, 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 a defeat. And um, uh, there was some uh, interesting uh, foreign policy issue was that uh, some, uh, some folks in the South wanted the U.S. to annex Cuba. Uh, during this time, and there were several uh, private military expeditions uh, uh, launched from the U.S. to overthrow uh, the Spanish government in Cuba, which which failed, and, and Cuba did not become part of the U.S. Uh, Fillmore tried to to run for the Whig nomination in '52, but lost to this uh, uh, General Winfield Scott, known as Old Fuss and Feathers. Who also lost. So next time we will talk about Franklin Pierce. That's all for now. Uh, I have office hours starting in 10 minutes. Uh, take a look at lab two uh, and I'll see you on Wednesday.